I kind of wanted to just do this, I guess almost you can call it a rant or something like that. It's something that's been on my mind for a while. Something I've talked about quite a bit in comment sections over the years on many other videos talking about the hard problem of consciousness and philosophy of mind in general. It's about this move that's been taking place where we're moving from materialism to idealism. And I'm going to explain a bit what that looks like and why that's happening and why idealism is the best uh, endpoint of all of that. And going about that, uh, David Chalmers actually explains this very well. In the Rutledge Handbook of Panpsychism, he talks about the mind-body problem and how it relates to idealism. This is the paper by David Chalmers. It's Idealism and the Mind-Body Problem. And I'm just going to go ahead and start off by reading out just this first section here. And this will be a good structure for tonight's journey. When I was in graduate school, I recall hearing, one starts as a materialist, then one becomes a dualist, then a panpsychist, and one ends up as an idealist. First, one is impressed by the success of science, endorsing materialism about everything, and so about the mind. Second, one is moved by the problem of consciousness to see a gap between physics and consciousness, thereby endorsing dualism, where both matter and consciousness are fundamental. Third, one is moved by the inscrutability of matter to realize that science reveals at most the structure of matter and not its underlying nature, and to speculate that this nature may involve consciousness, thereby endorsing panpsychism. Fourth, one comes to think that there is little reason to believe in anything beyond consciousness, and that the physical world is wholly constituted by consciousness, thereby endorsing idealism. Some recent strains in philosophical discussions of the mind-body problem have recapitulated this progression. So, the rise of materialism in the 1950s and 60s, the dualist response in the 80s and 90s, and the festival of panpsychism in the 2000s, and some recent stirrings of idealism. In my own work, I have taken the first two steps, and have flirted heavily with the third. In this paper, I want to examine the prospects of the fourth step, the move to idealism. And so what I'm going to do in this video is talk a little bit about this journey that Chalmers is talking about right here. And I guess it's best to start at the beginning. So when he talks about materialism here, and this is true, how he phrases this, a lot of people equate science with materialism. And they say that, well, if you do have a scientific explanation of consciousness, well, then there we go. We've got what we need for physicalism. But I think that's a bit misled. We've talked a bit uh, before on this show about how what science is really in the business of is not necessarily identifying what reality is, but uh, describing the structure and dynamics of the empirical world. So what we experience, uh, we just merely uh, take note of this, you know, we take mathematical descriptions of this, and we want to do experiments, of course, and we want to make predictions from there. We want to quantify what we're experiencing. We want to be able to measure it and be able to basically just use that information from there to accomplish various goals. But the goals of metaphysics and the goals of science are a bit different on that. And a lot of people want to equivocate those two. And I know there are, of course, scientific realists out there who want to say that science does tell us about reality and so forth, or that our best scientific theories really are true and so on. But, um, Either way, even if you are a scientific realist, that's not necessarily materialism. So materialism is the view that all that exists is matter, or sometimes people call it physicalism, and they say that all that exists is physical. Now, what exactly the physical is, is a bit of a mystery, as even alluded to by Chalmers here when he talks about the inscrutability of matter right here, when he talks right here, one is moved by the inscrutability of matter. And so what he's talking about there is that the science doesn't really tell us the intrinsic nature of what matter is. It's, it's just giving a structure and dynamics. And so the move to dualism from there is kind of set up, but uh, it, it kind of lays out the pieces as to why one would go on to dualism from there. If you check out the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entry on the hard problem, uh, it goes on a little bit right here. I like this paragraph. Some people say well, that this only describes uh, 
what makes the problem hard. And I think that's actually exactly what we need to explain what the hard problem is, because it's not just a problem. We know what a problem is, but why is this a hard problem? So why does this materialist view um, that all that exists is the physical world, what's the problem with that? Why is there this hard problem that would motivate one to dualism? So it says here in the IEP, in more detail, the challenge arises because it does not seem that the qualitative and subjective aspects of conscious experience, how consciousness feels, and the fact that it is directly for me, fit into a physicalist ontology, one consisting of just the basic elements of physics, plus structural, dynamical, and functional combinations of those basic elements. It appears that even a complete specification of a creature in physical terms leaves unanswered the question of whether or not the creature is conscious. And it seems we can easily conceive of creatures just like us physically and functionally that nonetheless lack consciousness. This indicates that a physical explanation of consciousness is fundamentally incomplete. It leaves out what it is like to be the subject for the subject. So if a purely scientific description of the world, as they say, or even if they want to go beyond science and they want to just talk about what's objective and quantifiable and quote unquote physical, well, if a quote unquote physical description of say the brain and the subject and physiology and all that stuff, if that leaves out what it is like to be the subject, well, then we would say uh, that this metaphysics is fundamentally incomplete. It does not tell us anything about this qualitative aspect of conscious experience. And some people uh, want to reject this idea that there are qualitative and non-qualitative aspects of conscious experience, but that's another topic we'll get into um, another time. Uh, what I just wanted to point out is that this appears to be one of the main problems for physicalism, known as the hard problem, and this is what motivates many to a kind of dualism. They want to say that, okay, well, if there is this physical matter, this other substance or property, whatever, well, then in addition, we would say that there's also a mental substance or property. So uh, while we want to get around the hard problem, you know, we want to get away from what the materialist says, by going to dualism, we end up kind of just landing into more trouble. If you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entry on metaphysics, which, by the way, metaphysics is just about what's real. It's identifying um, reality. It answers the question of what is. So, you know, epistemology is about how do we know what we know and what do we know. And ethics is about what's the right thing to do. And metaphysics is what is real. So when you get into the problems of metaphysics for the new metaphysics, these contemporary issues that persist in modern metaphysics, you have these, you know, other issues here, but this last one, you have the mental and the physical. And this is where the author of this entry, which I believe is Peter Van Inwagen, uh, explains what this uh, issue is. So if you take this view of things, where there is a mental and physical dualism, this is one of the main problems that you will face. It says, prominent among these is the problem of accounting for mental causation. If thoughts and sensations belong to an immaterial or non-physical portion of reality, if, for example, they are changes in immaterial or non-physical substances, how can they have effects in the physical world? How, for example, can a decision or act of will cause a movement of a human body? How, for that matter, can change in the physical world have effects in the non-physical part of reality. If one's feeling pain is a non-physical event, how can a physical injury to one's body cause one to feel pain? This is a problem that's persisted for a while. A lot of people uh, see this as kind of coming around with Descartes. I believe the problem has been around for much longer. But in, in terms of modern philosophy, the substance dualist view led to this question of, well, how is it possible for them to interact? One way philosophers try to get around this issue, this is brought up here. Uh, in addition to these dualistic theories, there are monistic theories. Theories that dissolve the interaction problem by denying the existence of either the physical or the non-physical. Idealism and physicalism. And I think there's a, a way that can be phrased a lot better 
because even this person says that there's a way to have a physicalist theory that does not actually deny the reality of the mental because that's eliminativism. This says right there, I think the idealist has an option there as well. But one of the main reasons I bring this up is that it's because it talks about dissolving this philosophical problem, this language here. Notice how instead of trying to solve the interaction problem, well, here's how the physical and non-physical interact. They instead try to negate the propositions that generate the problem. So when you say there's actually only one kind of stuff, and if you were to say, for instance, the physical, well, then, yeah, there wouldn't really be this uh, problem of, well, how is the physical interacting with this non-physical stuff? Because there is no non-physical stuff. There's only the physical, and you just account for everything in terms of that. As we saw before, this physicalist attempt at dissolving the interaction problem is not really successful because of the hard problem. A purely objective, quantitative world does not have room for um, a subjective and qualitative phenomenon like consciousness. So if you want to bite the bullet and be an eliminativist, you, you could try that, but that's uh, not preferred. When talking about uh, the eliminativist option for materialism to responding to the hard problem, it says, but eliminativism seems much too strong a reaction to the hard problem. One that throws out the baby with the bathwater. And it just seems highly counterintuitive to deny that consciousness exists. It seems extremely basic to our conception of minds and persons. A more desirable view would avoid this move. So it seems pretty widely accepted that um, eliminativism, uh, though some people want to present it as a, a good option, and you know, God bless them, it's, it's really not accepted as a good one. It's seen as sort of falling on its own sword, it's self-refuting, and I think people have every right to believe that. I think those are good objections to this. So I, I don't think living in denial is going to help us get out of this problem, though I do think dissolving uh, various issues will help us out here. So we just checked out the problems of physicalism and the move to dualism. So what now? All right, if physicalism and dualism is not really the answer, well, David Chalmers brought up how, well, perhaps panpsychism is an alternative. As we're going to see here, panpsychism really isn't actually an alternative to either dualism or materialism. Uh, this entry of the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy was written by David Skirbina. For those who don't know, David Skirbina, he's been around for a long time. He has a, a career spanning decades. He's a respected scholar, and um, he's somewhat uh, infamous for working with the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. He helped get some of the work out that the Unabomber was talking about. And um, I think that's kind of based. I think that's cool that he was willing to look past um, the, the, the crimes committed by Kaczynski to take seriously the philosophy that's being presented because of course it's ad hominem to dismiss what someone's philosophy is because of their flaws so if if them doing bad things does not discount uh, the truth of what they're saying well then if, if what they're saying makes sense and they have good arguments for it then we should take it seriously so i think that was really cool of him to do that but side rant over david scrubina um, is uh, an old school panpsychist. I think he's like one of the OGs of panpsychism in the West here and being one of the first ones to really start publishing about this more and more in the 21st century and late 20th century. Because you have guys like Philip Goff and other people who've come around, but I think Scribino was a bit before them. And uh, he brings up a really important point here where he notes how panpsychism is actually not a formal theory of mind. It is a conjecture about how widespread the phenomenon of mind is in the universe. So yeah, panpsychism is just the view that it's, you know, if you break down the words pan, all, psyche, mind, so just like that all, you know, has mind, or that, um, that, or that it's just ubiquitous is how it's often interpreted, that all has mind. And so when you look at that definition, that doesn't necessarily conflict with either materialism or dualism. 
um, I think he, I like how he says it here a bit more too. He goes on to say that panpsychism does not necessarily attempt to define mind, although many panpsychists do this, nor does it necessarily explain how mind relates to the objects that possess it. As a result, panpsychism is more of an overarching concept, a kind of meta theory of mind. More details are required to incorporate it into a fully developed theory of mind. So I thought that was um, pretty spot on. And he even goes on to say right here that in principle, the uh, panpsychist view can apply to virtually any conventional theory of mind. There could exist, for instance, a substance dualist view or even a panpsychist identity theory in which mind is identical to matter. No matter what you're saying mind is, so long as you're saying it is ubiquitous and fundamental, whether you're substance dualist, anything, you're still a panpsychist. So when, when they try to get around materialism and dualism with panpsychism, they're a bit misled because it's not panpsychism per se that's actually doing that work. This comes out a bit more clearly in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entry on panpsychism. So if you see here, it says that uh, panpsychism is the view that mentality is fundamental and ubiquitous in the natural world. Now, so far, so good. Okay, that first sentence right there, I mean, that is dead on the money. That is that is the epitome of panpsychism. But it starts to wobble a little bit here. He says, for the proponents of panpsychism, it offers an attractive middle way between physicalism on the one hand and dualism on the other. And he rightly points out here, he says, the worry with dualism is, you know, the, well, the view that mind and matter are actually fundamentally different kinds of things, is that it leaves us with a radically disunified picture of nature and the deep difficulty of understanding how mind and brain interact. And whilst physicalism offers a simple and unified vision of the world, this is arguably at the cost of being unable to give a satisfactory account of the emergence of human and animal consciousness. Panpsychism, strange as it may sound on first hearing, promises a satisfying account of the human mind within a unified conception of nature. Now, this is interesting because, as we saw before, panpsychism is not inherently monistic or dualistic. It's more of a meta-theory of consciousness that can fit with just about any conventional theory of mind. So, panpsychism doesn't actually give us an alternative to physicalism or dualism. I think what attracts those who are um, dissatisfied with materialism and dualism, why they want to go to panpsychism is because of, of problems with emergence that's often accompanied with the other dualist options. Sometimes, so there's the substance dualist, but sometimes what's brought up is property dualism. Okay, so property dualism is the view that the substance or the entity that bears properties or features, the substance is physical, but this one substance bears two kinds of properties, mental and physical. While this seems like a more modest version of dualism because they're not positing a duality of substances, this is still a kind of dualism. And I think what's implicit in a lot of what panpsychists say, such as, um, Micropsychist versions, which I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail as that is, um, they will say that, well, there's the fundamental physical entities, like, you know, the, the tiny particles that make up everything, as they call it. And they say all of those entities, all of the fundamental entities have consciousness or bits of consciousness, something like that. So if all of these micro level entities, you know, somehow come together, they can form macro level entities, and these micro conscious beings will somehow form macro level conscious beings. And this is um, seen as a more parsimonious approach to the hard problem, because we're not trying to get consciousness from non consciousness, right? We're not trying to fit um, consciousness, a subjective and qualitative phenomenon into a purely 
qualitative world. They're saying that we'll hold on. The world is fundamentally, you know, uh, objective and qu quantitative. They will admit this, but then they'll say in addition to that is um, these mental properties, these irreducible mental properties, these features of physical substances. Now, as much as that um, is attractive for getting around the hard problem, which I can see how it does in the sense of getting around the problem of emergence. You don't have to really worry about how you get consciousness from non-consciousness. It's fundamental and anything else that arises from it is also just more consciousness. But this does not get around the interaction problem is the thing. Some people think if they have only one substance, they can get away with a plurality of properties without any sort of interaction problem. But this is not true, especially when you examine what we saw before with what the interaction problem looks like on our entry on metaphysics, right? If we're talking about a material and an immaterial portions of reality, whether you're talking about substances, properties, processes, anything, how is this mental and physical interacting? How is this supposed to work? And this is admitted even in their entry on mental causation. If you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, if you go to mental causation, I like this. It's always kind of stuck out to me. Problem one is property dualism. I don't know, that just is interesting because it's like, it's not like this other side issue that's kind of brought up on the side here or there. I mean, this is like problem number one. <laughs> okay, if we're talking about mental causation, how are we going to account for it? The first thing that comes up here is actually property dualism. And here's what they have to say about it. They say that the arguments against soul-body interaction, which were used against Descartes, now couched in terms of properties instead of substances, could enter again here. For example, if you were worried about the mind-body nexus for souls, it seems you should also wonder how non-physical properties can find any traction in the physical world. We're just right back to the interaction problem. What motivated us away from physicalism in the first place was, all right, we don't want the dualistic interaction problem. So we're going to try to dissolve that by going to physicalism. By going to physicalism, we now have the hard problem. Okay, and to try to dissolve that, instead of trying to actually account, instead of trying to solve this problem, they dissolve that problem by saying, oh, well, it's fundamental. Consciousness is fundamental. You don't have to account for it in terms of something else. It's always been there. But now we're back to the interaction problem again. So what do we do? All right, what, what's the move from here for the panpsychist? Well, uh, one option that I see for them, uh, I think, lies in the intrinsic nature argument. So we saw one of the main arguments for panpsychism was the anti-emergence one, which we went over. The second most prominent one is the intrinsic nature argument. So simply put, the intrinsic nature of something is what it is. So, it, I mean, that's really all there is to it. It's just kind of a, a fancy term for this is what something is. So the intrinsic nature argument wants to say that, well, physics and stuff like that doesn't actually tell us the structure or doesn't actually tell us the intrinsic nature of the physical world doesn't tell you what the physical is. Okay, it only tells you structure and dynamics. And this is what Chalmers was getting at when he's talking about the inscrutability of matter. He goes, all right, well, we know that the mental is irreducible and it is, it's its own ontological type. We know the mental directly and immediately and we, we know it's real. So um, if we want to turn our attention to matter, the physical, well, what even is it? All we get are dispositions. All we're, all we're getting are just various behaviors of things that we experience. And then we just kind of like, um, we distinguish them with other behaviors of other entities that we're trying to describe. But again, like physics or at least scientific method isn't actually telling us what that nature is. So what they do, what the panpsychist usually does when they kind of formulate this argument, they'll say that, well, I know the intrinsic nature of, you know, this matter, what they call the human body, which they still distinguish 
as being distinct from consciousness. They'll say, well, there's the physical body, but I know that I'm conscious and the intrinsic nature of consciousness is irreducible. It's its own type. So if, if I know that, maybe I can speculate that other physical beings, maybe that's also their intrinsic nature. So it, it almost sounds like they're trying to say that like, well, there's this, this physical shell, non-mental shell, and inside of it, there's like these mental states. So there's still almost a kind of a dualism there. And, but, but, but if you actually interpret these terms properly, if the intrinsic nature of something is what it is, it's not like there's this non-mental entity with a mental entity inside it or something. The, 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 what you're calling the physical body is mental in its ontology. So this this is when uh, the panpsychist is getting to what is scrutable because we're talking about consciousness here in the sense that we're talking about what we can know about in terms of its nature. So if what we call matter really is just consciousness, that's what its nature is, that's what it is, that is idealism. That, that that's indistinguishable from it. You're, you're reducing the physical to the mental. Uh, Thomas Nagel talks about this. Um, I, I forgot uh, what his book was on this, but I talk about this in my video where I talk about um, how the why the panpsychist should be an idealist. And so, but this is what Chalmers is also talking about, about how, well, we actually look at matter through the lens of science and physics, or even what the materials is trying to tell you, it doesn't actually tell us what it is so maybe we can speculate he said in the paper maybe we can speculate that it's consciousness but i think it's also possible to form a a stronger argument and say well yes that is what its nature is and let me kind of go back actually to that paper because he did word something a little interesting here third one is moved by the inscrutability of matter to realize that science reveals at most the structure of matter and not its underlying nature and to speculate that this nature may involve consciousness thereby endorsing panpsychism so again you know if you look at each individual physical entity it's distinct and you're saying well what is nature is is that they want to say well then it looks like you're saying everything has its own mind everything has its own consciousness in this sense that just as you are a subject of experience of some kind all the particles, all the tables and chairs would also, in a sense, be subjects of experience, or at least have experiences in some sense. And even if it's not as complex as our own, that's what that that's how that's how this kind of panpsychism emerges. But the idealist kind of skirts around this, and I think this is what Chalmers wants to really get at here. He says, fourth, one comes to think that there is little reason to believe in anything beyond consciousness and that the physical world is wholly constituted by consciousness, thereby endorsing idealism. And maybe the combination problem is part of what motivates the step from panpsychism to idealism. And the biggest motivation here is maybe if panpsychism is true, why do we need anything non-mental? We've got all this mental stuff at the bottom level. Yeah, who needs, uh, who needs the, uh, the other stuff? And you might say, likewise, if panpsychist quantum mechanics is true, if these quantum states all involve qualia, then why have anything but qualia in your quantum states or in your, in your state of the world? So that's at least, that's a path to idealism. Now, this right here is a very legitimate path to idealism, and I can see why the modern philosopher would take this path, and it makes so much sense, right? It's, if you know the intrinsic nature of consciousness, and you're able to describe everything in terms of consciousness, even what we call the body, if you're even going so far as to say, well, that's what its nature is, it's actually just consciousness, that's what all matter is. Well, then what more is there to reality than consciousness? There's no need to posit these physical entities that are somehow distinct from consciousness, that are somehow non-mental in essence, or something like that, and you add mental properties to them. You don't have to do that. That actually just leads back to the interaction problem all over again. So what you can do instead is just say that's all there is, is consciousness. It's all up here now. You want to move something, you got to move it with your mind. Just focus. 
And when you think about that, you have completely dissolved the issues that we just brought up before. There is no interaction problem. There's no issue of how you get the mental and non-mental to interact because it's purely mental. That's all there is, is the mental. There's no question as to how you account for the uh, qualitative and subjective aspects of consciousness experience. There, there's no emerging of it. There's no how do you fit it in. Consciousness is exhaustive of reality. That's all there is. So the question doesn't even arise as to how do you account for the hard, how do you solve this hard problem? How do you account for it? So there's no interaction problem and there's no hard problem. This is a true alternative to materialism and dualism in a way that panpsychism does not offer. I see it as being moving more to a, a, an idealistic conception because although panpsychism um, solves a lot of problems in the philosophy of mind, it doesn't solve the problem of mental causation. Now, if you take if you remain a physicalist and become a panpsychist, you're still left with all the problems that Kim uh, explained about causal overdetermination or the mind being an epiphenomenism. An, an epiphenomenon. You've just moved the problem down from the level of biology to the level of microphysics. But if you take this idealistic view, um, then that particular problem goes away. And of course, you know, to be fair, one can try to say that they're offering, in a lot of these panpsychist versions, they can say that I am offering an alternative to traditional materialism and dualism, and I get that. But at the end of the day, that version will often become a version of property dualism, or it's going to lapse into idealism if they affirm something like the intrinsic nature argument. And I think a lot of these same issues arise for the other theories as well. If one is a neutral monist, I think a very similar problem arises as well. Like if you want to account for consciousness in terms of the neutral, that's just the hard problem all over again, but in terms of neutral entities instead of physical entities. If you want to say consciousness is irreducible and you don't want to account for it in terms of neutral, well then that's just neutral dualism. You're, you're going to say that there is this irreducible mental substance or property or whatever and then there's this neutral substance property and now you got to account for how those interact so neutral dualism or i should say neutral monism isn't really going to help you out here property dualism isn't going to help you out here other theories of consciousness maybe a, a general dual aspect theory is also not going to help out we're going to have this question and once again how do these material and immaterial aspects interact. Um, someone could try to bite the bullet and say they don't, but it's kind of like denying the existence of consciousness, right? The mental causation is seen as crucial. Um, we, we want to account for the reality of consciousness, the irreducibility of consciousness, but also the causal efficacy of consciousness. This is a big deal. If you go back to the uh, entry on mental causation, it's about the importance of mental causation. Mental causation, the mind's causal interaction with the world, and in particular, its influence on behavior, is central to our conception of ourselves as agents. Mind-world interaction is taken for granted in everyday experience and in scientific practice. The pain you feel when you sprain your ankle, causes you to open the freezer in search of an ice pack. An intention to go to the cinema leads you to get into your car. Psychologists tell us that mental images enable us to navigate our surroundings intelligently. Economists explain fluctuations in financial markets by citing traders' beliefs about the price of oil next month. In each case, a mental occurrence appears to produce a series of complex and coordinated bodily motions that subsequently have additional downstream effects in the physical world. Instances of apparent mental causation are so common that they often go unremarked, but they are central to our common sense picture we have of ourselves. So mental causation is 
seen as pretty important. Okay, if we're going to account for human behavior, despite the protests of the eliminativists and illusionists and so on, we can't really make much sense of these sorts of phenomenon without mental predication. Frankish constantly relies on mental predication. He, he wants to say he's having this physicalist picture of the world, but he's constantly going back to these mentalistic terms, this mental view of the world, and explaining the world in terms of that while trying to deny it. And um, I just think that is a huge mistake. And it reminds me of something else actually here that I would like to show you guys. If you go to the entry on behaviorism, for those who may not know, behaviorism was a philosophical movement which said that's all that really exists in terms of humans is just behavior. What you call consciousness either isn't real or is nothing more than just various actions of the physical body. Oftentimes they say there is no such thing as this qualitative and subjective experience. There's only the, the, some of these mindless behaviors that are conditioned and reinforced by the environment and so on. This is a dead movement. This was popular around the 50s and 60s when we were, uh, Chalmers talked about earlier about the rise of materialism and the scientific view of the world. That's when behaviorism was pretty big. That's when this, this was dominating the scene uh, this was the main view in psychology for a while at that time period until the cognitive revolution that happened with cognitive science. But what I wanted to say real quick, though, here is I wanted to point out what's said in the uh, conclusion. Carl Hempel was a behaviorist, but he decided, no, it actually must be incorrect. He noted that in order to characterize behavioral patterns, propensities or capacities, we need not only a suitable behavioristic vocabulary, but psychological terms as well. He says, Heppel had come to believe that it is a mistake to imagine that human behavior can be understood exclusively in non-mental behavioristic terms. Contemporary psychology and philosophy largely share Heppel's conviction that the explanation of behavior cannot omit invoking a creature's representation of its world, which I prefer to call its experience of its world. Psychology must use psychological terms. Behavior without cognition is blind. Psychological theorizing without reference to internal cognitive processing is explanatorily impaired. So we've seen how denying the existence of consciousness is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Reducing consciousness doesn't help us with the help with the hard problem or anything like that. Dualism just, of course, no matter what form we get into, will bring us back to the interaction problem one form or another. Panpsychism, as cool as it is, it's only a meta theory of consciousness. It's not really an alternative. It won't get us all the way to where we really are trying to go. But we still want to account for the irreducibility of consciousness as well as its causal efficacy. And no other theory available other than idealism can offer this. Way to go, kid! I did Every other view will lapse into some form of the hard problem in some shape or form or some version of the interaction problem. So, when it comes to panpsychism as well, uh, this leads into some other issues. Let me see if I can just find this uh, one section here on micropsychism. Because this, this does come up. When I, when I start talking about a little bit about the different versions of idealism and where we're heading right now. Because like I said, I already talked a bit about how we went from materialism to dualism to panpsychism. Before I, I actually explain where we are in idealism right now, I have to give a little bit of context as to where we are in panpsychism. So contemporary philosophers, it says here, tend to assume that fundamental things exist at the micro level. And that's true. Goff, who wrote the century, he's absolutely right about that. Coleman calls this smallism. It's the view that facts about big things are grounded in facts about little things. So this is often expressed as a kind of atomism. To get more specific, we can call this pluralism, where we're saying there's a plurality of entities that are fundamental, instead of a monism that says only one entity is fundamental. 
So the micropsychist uh, is 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 the panpsychist who says that it is the micro level. It is the small. It is the plurality of small entities that is um, ultimately uh, building up and constructing and composing macro level entities. So this often leads to what's known as the combination problem. Uh, and this comes up here in the article as well. I won't delve too far into that. The combination problem is essentially how do you get a distinct macro level consciousness from the micro level consciousness? And um, perhaps I'll do a separate video on that one day because that's a whole can of worms right there in itself. Um, but yeah, th this is largely seen. I'll just leave it at this for now, I guess, because I'm just getting a timeline for the most part. This is largely seen as a big problem, perhaps even a defeater for the micropsychist. So in order to sort of dissolve this problem, remember, see, notice there's this issue, right? Instead of solving these issues, sometimes what they do is they just dissolve the issues, which I have no problem with. They dissolve it by going to what they call cosmopsychism. Okay, so cosmopsychism is the view that um, instead of smallism, as he calls it, um, they accept what is formally referred to as priority monism. Priority monism is the view that one entity is fundamental. And this, this entity is whole. It's not composed of parts, even though this entity has parts. It's just that the parts derive from the whole. So there are other like macro and micro level entities under this view. It's just that there's one subject so the cosmopsychist says that there is one subject that is fundamental and all other beings derive including other subjects fragment from that being and i do think that this is a better approach to uh the combination problem i think the cosmopsychist has an advantage especially when you consider parsimony alone if one entity being fundamental is sufficient to explain the plurality of other entities, well, then why should you posit a plurality of entities? Why have a bunch of little entities building up to build other subjects when you could just have one subject fragmenting into many? Now, again, like I said before, though, the problem with panpsychism, because that's what this is, cosmopsychism is a version of panpsychism. Even the cosmopsychist view sometimes, unless they are explicitly idealistic, can sound a bit property dualistic in this sense here. If we're talking about still, if we're talking about the universe as a the physical cosmos as a whole is what's fundamental, and you're just saying that the physical cosmos has consciousness or just happens to be conscious. I would again think that sounds very property dualistic. You're going to have the same problems that we saw with dualism, interaction, and so on. So the idealist has a much better way around this. And Chalmers talks about this in the paper where he does talk about the different versions of idealism. So the first one we're going to explore, he talks about what's called macro idealism. So macro idealism holds that the mental states of humans and perhaps other macroscopic systems, like maybe humans, like animals or whatever, that is what's fundamental. And all of reality is grounded in these states. Now, this is not a position I'm too familiar with myself. I've been an idealist since late 2013. There's not too many idealists out there to interact with, but with the ones I have interacted with, I have not really seen too many who hold this view. I can't even really think of anybody uh, in history who did. I, I think, you know, one of the problems that kind of immediately is faced with this issue is that it doesn't seem as though we are fundamental. On its face, humans and animals, we, on its face, we seem derivative. It, it, you know, I started off as a baby, shirt, I grew. Um, this, this idea that there was a world before us, 
I guess, humans adds up just based on our observations of the world. It, it really doesn't appear as though we are. Maybe, maybe we are. I'm not necessarily saying I'm disproving that we are, but uh, this this view on its face isn't immediately attractive. Like if we're if we're moving away from materialism and dualism, and we're trying to get something that's a bit more intuitive, okay, what can we actually get a grip on? This one does not strike me as the first option to explore. And uh, what's interesting is that uh, Chalmers even notes that. Um, when it comes to grounding other beings, which is like the other issue here, just like how the panpsychist, you need to answer, well, how do you, you know, deal with accounting for other conscious subjects? Uh, the macro idealist has the same sort of issue and oftentimes they end up resorting to some form of monism is what he says. He says, um, well, the macro idealist commonly answer that these entities are grounded either in appearances or in a cosmic or divine mind, which is just what he calls cosmic idealism, which I'll get into in a moment. But before I get to that, we're gonna get into some more familiar territory, what he calls micro idealism. So micro idealism is the thesis that all concrete facts are grounded in facts about the mental states or mentality associated with fundamental microscopic entities, such as quarks or photons. So this looks like that pluralistic atomism that we see that's often phrased uh, by those who embrace smallism or atomism in the materialistic sense, but this is the idealist version. So um, it looks very much like the micropsychist uh, view. And I think the micro idealist is essentially going to have the same issue as before is the combination problem. How do you get these macro level subjects from micro level subjects? And also, I'll make one other brief moment here. I, I said I was going to save this for the, the, the video where I talk about this more, but I'll just say this briefly. Um, somebody like Emerson Green makes a good question, a good point here as well. He's like, well, we often see when it comes to myriology in general, when it comes to how do we get the whole from parts, or but when it comes to physical entities, like how do we get a wall from bricks, we don't really seem to have this problem of combination here, even though those like William James would say we do, actually. Um, most people would agree that, yes, we don't actually seem to have a problem there. If you look at, let's say, like Legos composing a, a Lego, you know, wall or something like that, that wall is nothing more than just those Lego bricks. There's nothing more to it. You can account for it purely in terms of those bricks and just combine together. But when it comes to subjects, we don't view macro subjects in that same way. Macro subjects are not seen as just a combination of micro subjects. It, at least it doesn't feel that way introspectively. It's not like there are these little minds together, just mashed together. And there's just like, you know, this plurality of little minds all working together. Like, you know, when you see those birds kind of all flocking together and they form these emergent patterns of flowing up and down left and right and all these different swirling motions that's not what our subjective experience seems to be like if if i am composed of micro level subjects i appear the macro mind would appear to be over and above the macro minds and if that's the case you've landed right back into the issues of strong emergence because even though, yes, you're getting consciousness from consciousness, you're not having to bridge this gap between mental and non-mental. If you are saying that macro subjects are over and above, they're totally distinct. They are more than that. The whole is more than some of its parts in this sense. It sounds a bit like one plus one equals three in the sense you got, you have a million macro subjects coming together and instead of just those million just being squeezed together and then there you go voila that's the that's the subject no you have an additional macro level subject above the micro level subjects and that just sounds like the issues of strong emergence once again and this is this is how william james kind of formulates the combination problem so macro idealism and micro idealism 
doesn't seem to help us out a whole lot uh, in terms of co combating the combination problem that we were trying to dissolve with panpsychism. So another perspective is this one right here. This is the one I favor. It calls this cosmic idealism is the thesis that all concrete facts are grounded in facts about the mental states of or mentality associated with a single cosmic entity, such as the universe as a whole, or perhaps a God. Now this, I think, has a much better grip on the problem because it's not about deriving the big from the small. It's not about trying to get these little things to make something more than the whole. You can instead start with the whole, and from that whole, you just fragment other minds from that whole. Now, how that looks like, uh, precisely how that's worked out, this is sometimes called the decombination problem. Um, one way to dissolve that is to embrace what's called existence monism, which existence monism says that there's only one subject, that's it. That's all that exists. So you have no problem of how do other minds decombine? How do other minds fragment? There are no other minds. There's only one subject that exists. So that seems like too extreme of an option to get rid of this issue. It, it appears, at least at, on its face, that there are, are a plurality of distinct entities. A lot of people accept the existence of ordinary objects. Um, even if we want to say they're mental, Sure, they're mental objects, then that, that's what they are. They're contents of consciousness. But, uh, but there is this question of how do you now um, uh, account for derivative subjects from the fundamental subject? And that's something I've talked a bit about already in some of my other videos. If you go to my channel, Monistic Idealism, I address some of that when I talk about dissociated alters as dream characters, and um, in general, I talk about a priority monism and idealism and so forth. Um, I will get into more detail as to how that works. There's lots of other idealists who have different answers as to how this works. Uh, Bernardo Castro talks about this, of course. You can check out his work if you want a contemporary idealist. But that's kind of, I guess, where we are right now in terms of the idealist um, progression of this whole stage here. When you go from materialism to dualism to panpsychism, here we are at idealism now. We've moved to that. And now we're trying to answer this question of, well, how do we um, get derivative subjects from a fundamental subject? And this seems a project worth uh, exploring more. It seems far more parsimonious than the alternatives. Instead of having a plurality, a potentially infinite amount of subjects is fundamental you just have one only one is fundamental and of course there's a plurality of other entities we just have to account for them in terms of that one fundamental subject and i think my channel uh, monistic idealism has made some progress on some of that um i think there's going to be many other scholars as idealism is taken more seriously i think other scholars will be very helpful in answering this some cosmopsychists are already on it, but I think once they fully embrace idealism, they will find it a lot easier to get a grip on this problem. So, um, yeah, I guess that's sort of the modern state of idealism right now. There are other in-house debates among idealists, such as uh, the debate about representationalism, whether we are directly aware of reality or whether we only are indirectly aware of it but you know when we're talking about this whole progression i guess that's about it um i really liked this part that chalmers had to say right here at the very end towards towards the conclusion he says that overall i think cosmic idealism is the most promising version of idealism it should be on the list of the handful of promising approaches to the mind-body problem. And the reason why Chalmers says this is a promising solution to the mind-body problem is because it has strengths stemming from unity 
and comprehensibility of the fundamental properties, as well as a particularly straightforward story about causal interaction, which comes down to mental-to-mental -to -mental interaction in the mind of a single subject. And I couldn't agree more. If panpsychism and the combination problem was um, not good enough, if you know, if you decided to go towards something like idealism, and you want to get around that problem, cosmic idealism seems to be the answer. So, I think this is where we're at right now. I guess in the modern field of idealism, and I think this is where we need to explore more. I hope more idealists come about in the professional academic world. And uh, on social media, on YouTube, all other platforms, um, I think there's just so much that has not been explored when it comes to idealism. There's, there's so much it has to offer. It's been neglected for so long. And we can see how it just does so much better than the alternatives. It has all the strengths of all the other views without their weaknesses. It has the monism of materialism which dissolves the interaction problem, but it also has the realism, uh, the irreducibility of consciousness that dualism offers. So it has the, the monistic strengths of physicalism without the hard problem, but it also has the irreducibility and causal efficacy of consciousness without the interaction problem that the dualist faces. So it just has the best of both worlds. Its uh, idealism is completely compatible with causal closure, as I talked about in my video on um, the argument from causal closure. There's no need for this natural, supernatural distinction. This does not imply uh, anything about magic or whatever. Um, we can have a very scientific and pragmatic view of the world while still admitting the reality of spirit, the reality of consciousness, the soul, God, um, all of that stuff, and have a, a far more rational view than what the physicalist wants to present us. That the physicalist either wants to eliminate consciousness, which is self-refuting, or they uh, just want to pray for this materialist messiah to come and save them and one day solve the hard problem for them. But I, I don't think that day is going to come. <laughs> I really don't believe in the materialist messiah. I don't think uh, the hard problem is soluble. Um, I think it's much wiser to dissolve it and to not buy into the premises that generate it. And if you instead embrace idealism, which you could still be a panpsychist, but you can just skip right over panpsychism. You don't have to be a panpsychist if you want to get around dualism and physicalism. You can just jump right into idealism. But, of course, you can keep both. And that's fine. That's cool. There's people like Timothy Sprigge who, uh, who are like that. And they're very respectable and that is a form of idealism that is very formidable, uh, in my opinion. I'm totally cool with a panpsychist idealism, or as Peter Ells calls it, panidealism. My own particular take on panpsychism is a, a kind of idealist take. Um, it's very close to Ru uh, Russellian monism. Um, I do believe in the existence of mental properties and physical properties, but it, uh, my view is that all mental, all physical properties rather, even so-called fundamental physical properties such as mass and charge, can be reduced without remainder to mental properties. I think that's about all I have for tonight. I was really just kind of wanting to share how you go from materialism to dualism to panpsychism and to idealism and where we are right now in idealism so i guess that's about it uh yeah thank you everybody for joining it was a lot of fun getting to talk with you and if anybody wants to share any comments by all means if you have any corrections or counter arguments or whatever you want to share by all means feel free so thanks again for joining have a good night